The Lowest is brought to you by Goodyear, helping you discover the road ahead. Goodyear, more driven. And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, where a trade that I joked about a month ago on a podcast, labeling it potentially the most depressing trade in NBA history, has happened. And with, with that news, it is time to once again say the three most anticipated words in niche basketball podcasting. What up, Beck? <laughs> What's happening, Zach? Um, wow. I, it's, it's sad to me that you already declared the trade the most depressing in history before it even happened because my first thought when it happened last night, maybe with the echoes of your pod still like rack, you know bouncing around my brain, all I could think was this is like the... I don't know, the the sad French clown. Is it Italian clown? One of those, you know, those old movies with like black and white with the sad clown wandering around uh, amongst sad people. That's this trade. Is it a mime or a clown? I the don't care. The distinction between the two it, is... I'm cutting it off now. I'm cutting it yeah, off now. I don't right. care. Um, so... I, I, listen, I, 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 I'm still trying to get over you destroying, uh, defaming, slandering pumpkin pie. So this is a rough week all around. Despite, despite that... Despite and, despite and that slander, anyway. despite that slander, did I did I last night uh, need to stress eat a little bit because of this trade? And did I stress eat a leftover slice of pumpkin pie? Yes, yes I did. Yes, I ah, did. Because wow. the other pie Redemption. is gone. Because the other pie, the good pie, is gone. <laughs> so was it, wait, wait, what was before we move on? What was the good pie? The quote unquote good pie, blueberry, which is oh, like a thousand times phenomenal. better than pumpkin pie. And the only Excellent. alternative was my daughter's snacks, and I have been. Uh, scolded rather harshly for invading my daughter's snack stash when I get caught doing. I still know when I won't get caught doing. It. I can sneak in there during off hours, but I, it was not possible last night. So look, <laughs> the, among the winners and losers of this trade are Ben Gordon and Corey Maggette, who previously held my record for the most depressing trade in NBA history in 2012 <sighs> when they were salary dumped for each other. And look, this is not an insult. Like I'm not trying to insult Russell Westbrook and John Wall. It's it's depressing in part because they are both really great basketball players, and through no fault of their own, the NBA has set up this supermax system. And I wrote about this two years ago in a column I'm frankly really proud of, and I think has aged well. That was built around Jimmy Butler and the Bulls just bailing out of the Jimmy Butler experience in case he became eligible for the supermax. It's sad to me that franchise players, franchise icons. John Wall is an icon in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Become the minute they put pen to paper on a Supermax contract, they transform into albatrosses. And I just think that's sad. It should be a point of pride for the Wizards to have picked John Wall, developed John Wall, convinced John Wall to stay now for all the money. And instead, the minute he signs it, it's, well, this contract is a, is a disaster. The Wizards are crippled until they can get off of it. Same thing with Russell Westbrook in Oklahoma City. I mean, talk about an icon. He's the one who stayed. He's the one who was an MVP, the triple-double guy. The minute he signs that contract, well, Oklahoma City's it's, it's crippling. It's an albatross. And, I, I, and we can talk about whether this is really a quote-unquote problem. When I did that story two years ago, a lot of GMs sort of said, you know, it's really not that big of a problem. The contracts are shorter now. We have the stretch provision. Teams know what they're getting into, this, that, and the other thing. Um, but it just is sad to me that – I mean, we saw it with uh, the Kings with DeMarcus Cousins. We're like, we, we got to get him the hell out of here. We don't want to supermax him. Paul George, I don't even think the Pacers wanted to supermax him. He ended up not being eligible for it. Blake Griffin didn't sign the supermax, but the Clippers were like – Franchise icon, number one pick, guy who made us relevant again, jumped over cars, killed Timofey Mozgov on live television. <laughs> Out. We don't want you anymore. You signed the contract. We didn't want you. There's something sad about that. Yeah. It's not It's not a healthy uh, part of the NBA ecosystem right now. You know, it's great for the players because they, they get paid really well. They would get paid really well without a super max, with just a normal max. Um but most of us are not going to be begrudge players making the most that they possibly can. But it does now come with a burden for the player too, because the player's now stuck in some in regard in some regard, or they're stuck, and the only way to move them on in a case like this is to move them to an equally difficult situation. So I don't think the players are ever going to say, "No, no, no, we don't want the supermax, or we don't want this this uh, chance to make uh, tens of millions more." But it does come at a cost for them. And their teams. If it hamstrings the team that you're on, 
and it makes it really hard to build around you. And then you're unhappy. And the only way to trade you is to trade you somewhere equally fraught and locked up. It's not good for them. So I'm not saying that's an argument to do, to eliminate the supermax. I'm not saying I begrudge the players making money, but all of these things these things always come with some consequences. And in this case, it it is the fact that that it 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 kind of fouls the system, and and it results in this. And I mean, there's no winners in this deal. Well, we could talk about that later. Um, let's let's because I, I think this topic is really interesting for a top. Seven player, six player, five player. It's a no brainer. The supermax is worth it for Giannis, yeah. for AD, for LeBron. Like it, the bang for the buck is worth it. Sure. For players fifteen and on, you're just not going to give it to those players. It's those players from like eight to fifteen, where it's like, are they really good enough to be the number one guy in a championship team? Are they really? And it gets dicey. And so, like you said, no one. Let's be clear. No one, including me. The players should get all the money. The league is about the players. Give yes. the players all the money. I don't begrudge anybody for getting the money, taking the money, signing for the money. So I pitched in that column several several ideas, half-baked, three-quarters baked, under, under-baked, as Paul Hollywood would say. It's under-baked. The flavor is not coming through. Um, uh, I hope your pumpkin pie was not under-baked. The ginger is really coming through, but the tomato it's not coming through. Um, uh uh, and to, to alleviate this problem, and I know that last season, every team that came to New York City, which is every team, was invited to the NBA to pitch salary cap ideas to Adam Silver as lieutenants. And a lot of them were surrounding this idea of how can we make the Supermax something that is triumphal instead of crippling. So here are some ideas. Are you ready for some ideas, Mr. Beck? Hit me. If you draft a player... And sign him to a supermax, thirty-five percent of the cap. This is one, okay? It only counts for let's say twenty-five percent of the cap for luxury tax and salary cap purposes. The player gets all the money, but the cap hit is less. And yes, that transfers over if you trade the player. That's one. Number two, but that all that does is save the owner money. Really, it's not that big of you. Not that it's not helping you build a team so much. Idea number two. You sign a player to a Supermax that you draft. Obviously, you, you can only sign the players that you draft to Supermax. Um, you get, maybe in conjunction with the reduced cap hit, you get an extra mid-level exception. Something like that. Is that fair? Maybe not. I pitched a one-time only, once every like 10 years amnesty provision, where if you end up in a John Wall situation with a Supermax player, you can amnesty that player and the cap hit goes away. The player gets all his money. That has creates a moral hazard. It's kind of a get out of jail free card. I get that. Um, teams have pitched these. Uh, one team pitched a, a similar thing called a legacy contract, where it, again the cap hit is is a little bit less. I just think there are there. It may, maybe maybe a max deal stays at thirty five percent of the cap. One of the things that happened with these max contracts was their eight percent raises started to outpace. The increase in the salary cap so a 35 percent deal became a 40 percent deal by accident i just think i think these ideas are interesting they've been in the ether and i just it's there's something just sad about a system where homegrown superstar players all nba level players become albatross contracts instantly upon signing i just i don't know if any of those tweaks work if they're realistic if you like them if you hate them but i just feel like some tweaking needs to be done I don't like the idea of giving teams more benefits. Like the, the point of the Supermax, if people uh, will remember, was this was about the Kevin Durant type situations. If you, you know, every, the, the, you know, the NBA is constantly trying to construct new methods for, at least they used to, um, for trying to keep players in place. Because once upon a time, that was the, the, the entire system was set up to do that. Bird rights, everything. The NBA has invented a thousand different things to try to induce players to stay put because... Uh, of the idea that continuity and and especially protecting small markets from losing their guys was good for the league as a whole. I think in general, that's true. I, I and, and unfortunately for the league, the last 10 years, no matter what they've done, it, it, it it's all just disintegrated. There, there is no keeping a guy uh, in place. There, there are no more financial inducements because the money to the credit of everybody involved has gotten so huge that there's there's no disincentive anymore. We, I, we, I've written about this before. It used to be, you know, Dwight Howard once upon a time, I think it was like when he was going to leave the Lakers for the Rockets. Well, he's giving up 30 million in guaranteed money on the extra year plus the raises. Da, 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 da. 
30 million when it was the difference between 90 and 120, while still outrageous to most of us and still mind blowing to most of us, that still felt like real money and a real sacrifice. And he was one of the first to leave that much money on the table. But when the difference is now 220 versus 250, I mean, at some point it just gets, it, 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 it's immaterial, not immaterial, but it's, it's, it's hard to grasp how that even matters anymore. Um, you, were doing, it, you were doing proportions. That was a very good math, <laughs> lesson on mathematic proportions. So, but that's where we are. That's where we are. And so the, the bird right stuff was about one more year. It was seven years versus six years once upon a time, then, then six versus five and now five versus four years. So it was the extra year. It was the higher raises. None of that matters anymore. Everything the NBA invented over the course of decades is irrelevant now. And so, but that's the basis for the supermaxes that we're now talking about uh, as, as these uh, creating these albatross contracts and locked up situations. Um, I'm not, I'm not sure what the answer is there. I do think that the NBA needs to kind of reassess this whole thing, either decide and, and give in on the point that players, that there's no way to, to keep them in markets anymore. Anyway, there are no financial incentives to keep them. If they want to leave, they're going to leave. And maybe that's, maybe that should be the case. You could go back to, to longer contracts. I mean, the great irony of all this now is that the M NBA is the one that wanted to shorten contracts over the course of one CBA after another, after another, constantly ratcheting down another year over the player objections because the players union used to be in favor of more long-term security. I think they would be role reversed now. I think if the NBA came to them and said, we want to go longer contracts again, the, the, the union would say, no, 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 oh, we're no. good. I've asked, I've asked Michelle Roberts about this yeah. for the record in a column and it's a, it's a hard no. It's, which it's is, a, we want our players to have freedom of movement. Which if you went back to the prior uh, CBAs and prior union leadership, if you looked at 99 or 90, the 98 lockout, the, uh, the, you know, 2005, 2011, all the CBA years, that was always a concession by the players. Well, but by up. the way, nothing's a hard no. Nothing's a hard no. Well, there are no, yeah, there's you always give, You give me, you give me, give me three percentage points of BRI. Suddenly it's not a hard no anymore. And, um, and not, good, good and luck not with to, that though. Not to get too far in the weeds, but two two other quick thoughts on um, the CBA and, and the structure of all this stuff, which is how we got here. One is what you described, Zach, about, um, you know, look, you, you you almost have to give these guys the super max if they're eligible, right? Like you, that's that, that was the right thing to do. And it was maybe the only thing to do. And but this goes back to the whole concept of the max in the first place. The max was created in 98 prior to, to the lockout in 1998. You could give a player any number that you could pull out of a hat that either was by their bird rights or still with under the, the salary cap. There was no such thing as a maximum contract until the 98, uh, 99 agreement. And once they created the max, every best player on his team said, I, I'm, I'm your max guy. So Antoine Jameson got a max deal with the Warriors and Bryant Reeves got a max deal with the Vancouver Grizzlies. If you were the best player of the team, suddenly... Well, I'm your max guy. You got to give me the max. And so it, it created a, a, a new construct that immediately uh, created a, a, a cap nightmare for, for most teams. Because as you put it, Zach, there are six guys who the Supermax would actually be justifiable for, and you'd be happy to give it to them. But everybody else, the ones who are still perennial all-stars, but never going to be an MVP, or all-star three out of five years, but never really going to be elite elite, they're really good players, but they're not worth a super max and they're not worth tying up your, your cap. But because they're eligible and because they've earned it and because players have uh, that much sway now um, and you, because you don't want to look bad as a team, they get it. And then you have to deal with the consequences. The other one is this. I've always thought that annual raises were stupid <laughs> and they remain stupid because they're, they're it's this fixed percentage where, you know, non bird gets whatever four and a half percent and the bird guys get seven and a half or wherever those levels are now. They're dumb. One if you're earning, you know, a hundred million over four years, you don't need raises at all. Just, just make it, just spread it out. I understand like you, you want it to kind of grow with the cap. Well, if that's the case, then make raises always tied to the um, year to year increase in BRI, make, make it a percentage so that it, it, it climbs in concert with the cap so that you're not taking up, you know, 35% of the cap in year one, but 50% of the cap in year three or however it might go. Like the raises don't make sense because the, they they can, as you put it, outpace the growth of the cap itself. Also, when you're making it, like raises are important for like, you know, the the, the checkout person at, you know, Rite Aid, um, who's you know making $12 an hour and next year could make $13 an hour uh, if they're lucky. Um, but 
NBA players don't need don't need raises on contracts that that stretch into the uh, you know tens of millions per year. Let's talk about the trade itself. Russell Westbrook goes to Washington. That's a weird thing. All of it's weird. It's John weird. Wall um, goes to Houston along with a protected first round pick in 2023 lottery protected then top 12 protected 2024 top 10 protected 2025 top eight protected 2026 then two second rounders so the highest pick the rockets can get out of this is nine um in six years <laughs> when i mean who knows who knows what will happen in six years no that's um, what i'm saying like to, the highest the pick could get is ninth and that's in 2026. That's six years from now. Maybe we'll all have COVID-21 uh, by then. I don't know. Um, but oh who, who the hell knows what's going to happen. If you're a business owner, you don't need us to tell you that running a business is tough, but you might be making it harder on yourself than necessary. Don't let QuickBooks and spreadsheets slow you down anymore. It's time to upgrade to NetSuite. Stop paying for multiple systems that don't give you the information you need when you need it. Ditch the spreadsheets and all the old software that you've outgrown. Now is the time to upgrade to NetSuite by Oracle, the world's number one one cloud business system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control over your financials, HR, inventory, e-commerce, more, everything you need all in one place instantaneously. Whether you're doing a million or hundreds of millions in revenue, save time and money with NetSuite. Join the over 22,000 companies using NetSuite right now. Let NetSuite show you how they'll benefit your business with a free, that's free, product tour at netsuite.com slash low, L-O-W-E, my last name, the name of this podcast. Schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash low, Nets, netsuite.com slash low. Basketball-wise, let's start with Washington. Um, they they are clearly getting the better player, um, in part because John Wall hasn't played in two years and he's coming off. I've lost count how many surgeries and an Achilles tear. So Russell Westbrook, I didn't vote him All NBA last year, but he made it and he was a worthy candidate for it. He was absolutely spectacular um, from like January till the hiatus. Then he got the coronavirus and he injured his quadriceps and he was plainly not the same player. Now we can talk about whether Washington is equipped to. Um, uh, have the same sort of ecosystem the Rockets did to facilitate Russell Westbrook just rampaging to the rim over and over again. But he's a better player than John Wall. And I think he's better enough to justify giving up this pick. Like I was very surprised Kevin Pelton gave this a D for the Wizards. Um, and his point was the contracts are equivalent year for year, dollar for dollar. You're not shaving off a year. So John Wall's contract is not materially any worse. They're almost identical, the same three-year contracts. Their dollar amounts are the same. To him, whatever upgrade and talent Russell Westbrook presents is not worth that pick for a team that is at least a 50-50 bet to be rebuilding when that pick comes due. I thought that was really interesting because I I, I kind of like this trade for the Wizards. I think they're getting the better player. The fit with Beal to me is just okay, largely because John Wall is a well, whatever John Wall was, a better passer and a a less hoggy player than Russell Westbrook. Russell Westbrook takes a lot more shots. He's the all time usage rate guy. Him and Harden, um, and so I think. Like I, I, Russ fits with Beal and he fits with the Wizards in some senses, but that fit will go from a B minus to an A minus the minute he stops taking 9,000 mid range jumpers every night, which there's no evidence he's ever going to do that. Um, <laughs> but look, I think the Wizards, I said on Monday, I, I if I'm the Hawks, they're, they might be the team I'm most worried about in pursuit of the number seven and eight spots in the Eastern Conference. I think they've tacked a win or two at least onto their projected win total. I'd be curious what Pelton's projections show. And they should be right in that mix for eight, nine play in spot. And, you know, if I'm like one of the losers of all of this activity, including Gordon Hayward to Charlotte, are the Orlando inertia because the Orlando inertia have gotten the luxury of limping into the playoffs the last two years. I mean, they didn't limp in two years ago. They're actually playing quite well and they were playing decently uh, before the stoppage last year, but like they didn't do anything in the off season. Jonathan Isaac's hurt. They lost DJ Augustine. Like I'm looking at this. If I'm them, I'm like, man, we're not, we're not, we're not guaranteed one of the upper two seeds in that play in tournament. That's for damn sure. But I, I, I kind of, I kind of like it for Washington Houston is just a kind of a question mark. What what were your kind of initial reactions? Um, 
First of all, I, I, I'm wondering this, and I don't know how to look this up. I'm wondering if an all NBA player has ever been traded for so little coming off of an all NBA season. Like, it's not like Russ was a distantly all NBA. He was all NBA literally this calendar year and was just traded for a guy who hasn't played in two years coming off of an Achilles and a uh, protected pick. There was pick that... no market for Russell Westbrook. Yeah. I kept saying this right. over and over again. The Clippers were not interested. The Knicks were not interested unless they were incentivized. I don't know where the Hornets noise came from. Maybe it was credible. All I can say is from the people I know there, I never heard they were interested. Mm. There was, to my knowledge, nothing. For Nothing. a guy who was for a guy who was MVP three years ago and was All NBA this season and still put up monster numbers and um I, I, you know Westbrook there's a lot of flaws in the game and the contract is what it is but holy moly I mean to be traded for you know we, we don't know what John Wall is this, that's the thing and that's why like to me I'm, I'm surprised at Pelton's grades the Wizards clearly won this deal if there's there is there are no winners here but to the extent that somebody has to have come out a little bit Corey ahead. Corey McGetty and Ben Gordon. Corey McGetty and Ben Gordon and Timofey Mozgov and Bismack Biombo. Winners. Rich, Rich, Richard Lewis, Gilbert Arenas. Um, Winners. I, I, at least if you're the Wizards, you, you at least have solved the wall Beal. They're fine, but they're not really fine. We're going to tell you they're fine, but they're not fine. And then we're going to keep telling you. To that point, can I read you an, an excerpt that I think is very important from David Absolutely. Aldridge? David Aldridge's piece in the Athletic today. Da obviously is a DC icon himself, and is and he had a, in there and had a great piece on this t a couple weeks ago, pleading with uh, ownership to to finally admit the obvious. So he says this, but did Beal want to wait any more for Wall to get back where he was before the injuries? Did he believe Wall was as diligent about his rehab as rehab as he could have been? Did he want to go back to a supporting catch-and-shoot role, which seemed inevitable even as Wall professed he'd played differently with Beal, seeing how Beal's game had grown the last two years? No. Leonsis, Ted Leonsis, the owner, had also come to believe that Wall was, often if not always, quote, too cool for school in his thinking. And the shirtless video of Wall at a party this summer flashing gains, gang signs was the last straw. Tommy Shepard came on my podcast. He, he also said he didn't want to trade John Wall, which... I'm sure he believed at the time. I was I was pretty surprised at how openly unhappy and angry he was about that video. I really think that video mattered. But the more interesting part of DA's reporting there, and I've heard burblings of the same, is the stuff about did Beal believe Wall was as diligent about his rehab as he could have been? No. That's that's quite interesting. That's interesting. It's it's damning. Um but look, I've been saying for at least a year, I don't understand why Bradley Beal hasn't asked out. There's this is the other one, the Bradley Beal professing his his uh, loyalty and 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 desire to stay there long term. The Wizards saying we have no desire to trade. Like this still feels inevitable. And I actually one of my reactions to this trade last night was this feels like a prelude to a trade for both Harden and Beal, because if you're Harden, it didn't fix anything. You just got worse. And so, and maybe that was going to happen anyway. Maybe this doesn't change anything. Maybe it was always inevitable he's going to be dealt. But if there was any hope of trading Westbrook and reshuffling and maybe making things more uh, promising in the in the near term for Harden, there, this did this this certainly didn't do it. I don't know if there was any any outcome that could have. But this feels like they're 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 going the wrong direction. If the Harden train is out of the station, this is not stopping it. Yeah, yeah. But I think this sped up the Harden train, if anything. And for the Beal situation, 27 years old, in his prime, can't make all-star teams or all-NBA or get any other recognition whatsoever because he's being dragged down by a team that, that can't make the playoffs. And maybe he's part of that, or he, of course, is part of that. But still, if you're him, all you're thinking is, I'm not getting the recognition or the success that I deserve despite my great numbers and being one of the best players in the league at my position. And it's because I'm here. It's because I'm on this team. And if I'm somewhere else with better supporting cast, I will be a perennial all star, which, which he has has every right to think. How can how can he possibly be thinking any differently today? Okay, so he's got Westbrook instead of Wall. Westbrook at least has played recently, as opposed to Wall, who hasn't played in two years, and is coming off of one of the toughest injuries. Um, but I don't I don't see how this makes things any more promising. See, I, I think it's a material difference. If I'm Bradley Beal, this is a material difference to me. Ma um, all right, material, but material enough. I mean, you and I, we, we're now discussing, could the, does this mean the Wizards who 
I, I know we've got this playing tournament, which is going to keep messing with my head because I keep thinking about, well, the Hawks were, were the better team probably on paper. And so they're the eighth seed. And now the Wizards are now, I know you could be ninth or 10th now, and maybe you're making the playoffs anyway. Um, but the, okay. So, so put the Wizards in play for the play in tournament or to be the eighth seed so that they can get, you know, uh, clobbered in the first round i mean where where is this put them a year from now two years from now three years from now as westbrook is going downhill uh, it's, it's a marginal upgrade in the short term but the very very short term because what, russ is 32 so i'll say this the reason everyone is saying atlanta's fighting for eighth and this this is a people are pen, penning penning sharpieing in seven teams boston milwaukee toronto miami indiana philadelphia brooklyn that's a hard yeah. reality if you think yeah. all seven of those teams are locks Yes. Then that's just there is no. It's like it's like when you pick the All Star team. There is no 14th roster spot. That's all yes. there is. Look, Sharpie, if you will, and some of those teams certainly deserve Sharpie status. Someone in that group is taking an injury. Someone in that group is having a down year from two players. Someone in that group is underperforming their win projection. Someone in that group is making a trade because things go haywire. You can Sharpie them in if you want. But someone in the, if you tier those teams, someone in the bottom tier is gonna is gonna have a worse season than you expect, and the door is gonna crack open a little bit for someone else to chase them. That's all I'm. That's all. It's that. That's just reality. If the NBA were perfectly predictable, nobody would watch it. Like someone is gonna underperform by a lot, and yeah. someone in the bottom is gonna overperform by a lot. That's why it's okay. fun. Okay, and and I agree, and I think the Pacers are poss- possibly that team. Sorry, Indiana. Um, but let's let's say that the Hawks and, and Wizards both make it. Uh, at, a play-in tournament is done and whatever, and they're the seventh and eighth in, in some order. Is is Bradley Beal going to be happy with his his first round exit next to Russ instead of his first round exit next to John Wall? Hey, I'll, I'll say this: Brad Beal balls out in the playoffs, and John Wall did too. And for all all the hashtag that's so Wizards and. The Wizards, everyone makes Was fun of the hashtag? Wizards. I don't know. So Wizards, something Wizards. Everyone <laughs> makes fun of the Wizards. Probably because their name is Wizards and it's a stupid name. <laughs> this team won one playoff series. One. Between 1982 and 2014. One. One. That's hard to do in the NBA. In 2014, they make their debut. Wall and Beal, they smash the Bulls. The tough as hell Bulls. Smash them. Take the Pacers to, I think, five or six games the next round. 2015, they sweep the Raptors. Humiliate the Raptors. Almost caused, like, massive organizational change in the Raptors. And they're 2-2 with the Hawks when John Wall breaks his wrist. The 60-win Hawks. There's the big what if. 2016, they go so Wizards and some stuff happens they don't make the playoffs. 2017, they beat the Hawks again. They go to Game 7 against Boston. John Wall makes an iconic three-pointer to win Game 6. Stands on the scoring table. They lose Game 7. That's the famous funeral series where they're all where the teams are doing silly stuff like dressing in black. Look, all I'm saying is, yeah, no conference finals, right? No one thought of them as a title contender. But those dudes showed up. And I can tell you that the teams above them in the standings, like no one's excited to play John Wall and Bradley Beal. Those guys, when when Wall was Wall, they elicited fear and respect, even in teams that were above them in the standings. Like Cleveland with LeBron, they f-ing laughed at the Raptors. You saw it. Like LeBron had the famous quote, like, I've been in more stressful situations in my life. They laughed at the Celtics until 2018 when they didn't have Kyrie anymore. They laughed at them. They didn't laugh at the Wizards because those two guys are supernova talents. And so look, Maybe they get the seventh seed. Maybe they do get swamped. Maybe they do get stomped. If they're healthy and Russ is healthy, they got a lot of shooting. We can talk about the fit. I'm not ruling them out of being 2-2 in a game five against Toronto or Boston or Miami in the first round of the playoffs. Maybe they lose, but I'm not looking at them as just roadkill. I think they have an upside that is above roadkill. How about that for the Wizards? Your upside is above first round roadkill. (laughs) That was a hell of an endorsement. Um, fair. All of that. Uh, all of that fair. I would just caveat the, um, it, it, you know, on the all the the you know the qualified success that Wall and Beal might have had together, and the fear that they, that they might have invoked, or the respect at least that they elicited. Um, they still never won more than forty nine games in the regular season, at their best. And when they did, when they won that division title, I was at the Staples Center when they clinched it. 
uh, by either I guess they must have beaten one of the LA teams or the right team lost. And they were showering each other in the locker room with in the visitor locker room with water bottles. And I was thinking, mm. it's a it's a division title. It's, yeah. it's a, it's a, do I even yeah. know the name of their division off the top of my head? Atlantic Coastal, the ACC. They won something. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. The mid mid coast division. Um, yeah, that's never, southeast. That's, southeast. They're in the southeast division. I think. I, I think that's correct. It's either that or the Smythe. Um, I. I, I <laughs> Um, I couldn't tell you a single other one of those, by the way. I don't even know where that one came from just now. Um, I couldn't even name you seven hockey The teams. Lady Bing? I think that's a the trophy. La- that's a trophy. <laughs> um, look, I, I, maybe the Wizards bought themselves time again. I thought this a year ago when they gave Beal the extension, which was not really a, a an endorsement of where the Wizards were going. It was more of, you know, Bill can get some long-term security. There was probably a, a, an understanding that, listen, if, if you're unhappy, we will we will move you. He gets some security. They get to buy themselves a little more time. It was Tommy Shepard's first year as GM. And now uh, here they are heading into the first, you know, year of the post-wall era. Maybe they've bought themselves a little more time to see how well Westbrook and Beal actually play together. Does Rui Hachimura make a big step? Does, uh, you know, uh, Denny... Avdia, am I gonna? I'm, I'm gonna screw up the the accenting on his last name. Um, don't does, look at does, me. Don't look at me. <laughs> does he? Uh, does he make uh, an impact in in year one? Um, do any of these other pieces kind of click into place? I mean, there's not a lot on that roster to look at and say, you know, yeah, that's where the promise lies. Um, I I must be crazy. I just must be crazy because I like Hachimura in the role he's gonna play. Bertans mm-hmm. can shoot shoot your brains out and i'd like thomas bryant now is he going to be overmatched defensively as a starting center maybe but i'll tell you this he can shoot he shot the hell out of it in the bubble from three and russ for whatever fault you want to ascribe to him and i have ascribed them all in the rare opportunities he has gotten to run a proper spread pick and roll not with freaking Andre Robertson and Terrence Ferguson and all the Oklahoma City wing brigade who can't shoot. A real spread pick and roll. He has been unstoppable. Unstoppable. And he is going to get the opportunity to do that here. The question is, will he turn those opportunities into too many mid-range jumpers and will he marginalize Brad Beal? They can stagger minutes and all of that. I think this team is going to be a dynamic offensive team. The defense, big question mark. But I like some of the talent, and I think this team is going to score. I think they're going to be a problem on offense. And and in this league, if you are elite offensively and just kind of meh to sub meh de- defensively, you you certainly can be a lower tier playoff team and maybe get yourself even a little bit further than that if you are dynamic offensively. And so, yeah, it looks there's there's an upside here. Um, there's there's a there's a path to being fun, exciting, respectable. Um, but that's the ceiling. And I don't think if if there's anything that that um, I'll just leave it here with the Bradley Beal discussion. My assessment of where he has been the last couple of years, or where I think he is, or where he could be, or what he might want, is simply about the 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 basic uh, construct of if you're a perennial All Star or All Star caliber player in your prime, and you've hit a ceiling in this league in this era, you have, you eventually see that you've hit that ceiling, and you say it's time to move on. And I don't know that. Uh, plugging in Westbrook at age 32 for a few pyrotechnics in the coming season and and just to be fun and exciting and relevant again, that's something. But I don't I don't think that gets him to the goal that I would assume a a, a player in his prime with that level of talent would want. Um, so that's it. Uh, a, but you're a, right. And, it's and this a fair is, concern. And it's a tremendous amount of shooting around Westbrook, which could be fun. Uh, uh, how much of an expense to Beal? Will 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 be the primary concern. I have to believe, um, but the Wizards are more fun, and and the Rockets are now uh, to me an unmitigated mess, despite having a perennial MVP candidate. Yeah, I'm not really even sure how to address this for the Rockets because if James wanted Russ out or Russ wanted to be separated from James, fine, that's cool. Like Wall, we just don't know. I mean, there's just no way. There's no good analysis to do there. Yeah, the John Wall of three years ago. He's fine. He can do what Russ did, and he's a better three-point shooter. I think he's a better passer. I think John Wall's like a really underrated passer. Um, he's really good vision. He sees the game kind of a half beat ahead, but we just don't know. I mean, and it and it feels like the the lack of certainty about whatever he is feels like a little bit of a white flag for Houston. Like I thought 
if Russ and James can, you know, whatever, coexist, I love the Christian Wood signing for them. Like, James Harden is a walking playoff berth. That's what yes. he is. He, he's a yes. one-man playoff berth. He's a one-man offense. Um, this feels like a step back for them. And that has huge playoff implications in the West because they're obviously one of those teams in the top eight that you put in parentheses and say, well, we don't know what the hell is going to happen. And now we don't know what the hell is going to happen. It's kind of come to fruition. And if you're, you know, Phoenix or Memphis or, you know, whoever is in Golden State, who you think is whatever you think of the Warriors, I think you're a little more optimistic today that maybe one of those playoff teams is on its way to being nudged out. Yeah. I mean, I'm not ready. I'm, I'm with you. Harden is, is, is a walking playoff berth on his own, no, almost no matter what you put around him. And they'll find their way anyway. But if this is the prelude to a Harden trade and it's going to happen, if not in the next few weeks, then at least before the trade deadline, then maybe the Rockets are the team you pull out of there to uh, elevate Phoenix or somebody else, New Orleans. Um, New Orleans. I forgot about New Orleans. To me, the hardest team to project in the NBA is New Orleans. I agree. Uh, um by the way, one other moral of the story here, since the Westbrook thing, I didn't think I could hate the Westbrook trade any more than I did at the moment that the Rockets made it. And this actually made it worse because it only lasted one year. They gave up two firsts and two swaps to, to, to get him. They trade him to get a very protected distant first. Um, it's, it's, it's been, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was bad at the time they made it and, and it, it just got, I feel like it just got worse. Um, it did Darryl just Moore, get Daryl Moore is like, what do you, what do you, I don't know what trade you're talking about. I'm, I'm the GM of the, I'm the <laughs> well, GM of the Sixers now. I just got Danny Green. I just got Danny Green for Al Horford. What do you talk, I don't even know what you're talking about. Um, but the reporting, including from your Tim McMahon, is is that, and this was heavily, heavily rumored slash speculated slash uh, just circulated at the time, that this was not a Daryl Morey move. This was a Tillman Fertitta slash James Harden move. So one, don't let your, I know the owner owns the team. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of part of the deal. Don't let your owner and your franchise star make trades. Um, I know it's a really hard one well, to look, actually. And James Harden, you had Dwight gone. You had CP gone. You had Russ well, gone. I've said it before. You are the common denominator. Yep. Now, 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 all those dudes have issues. No one was clamoring to play with Dwight when he left Houston. Russ is a is a you know persnickety fit. Um, CP is you know is 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 it brings a lot of personality to the table. I think he's an unbelievable player and I think he's going to help Phoenix a lot, but it does not really appear that other great players are super interested in playing with James Harden and your way can be your way. You got pretty far your way. The one year that everyone clicked, you almost got to the promised land, but that's the one year you almost got to the promised land. Your way is probably not going to do it. And, yeah. and you have to find a way to appeal to other great players. And there's just not a lot of evidence that, that that's going on in Houston. Um, persnickety fit, by the way, you just said persnickety fit. That should be the name of a ska band. That would be a phenomenal name for a ska band. We, sh fit. we should end by talking about the Western conference playoff race. Oh, by the way, the team at the top of it had a great off season that they just sort of decided, you know what? Yeah, we got Marcus soul. That's cool. Wes Matthews, you know, Brought guys, brought our core guys back. Why don't we just top it off by extending LeBron James for two years and signing Anthony Davis to a five-year, one hundred and ninety million dollar max extension? Which I didn't think he was going to take the full boat. I thought he would try to get back into free agency for his tenth season or after his tenth season to get the thirty-five percent max. I think it's an interesting move for him to say, you know what, I'm happy. The plague is still here. I don't know what the salary cap is going to be like. I don't know if I feel comfortable sort of playing those timing games. I'll just lock it in. And look, there's not a lot of analysis to be done here. It's awesome for the Lakers. The Lakers are coming into next season. I honestly think in a tier of their own. When I tier the teams, I think the Lakers are going to be in their own tier. Because I don't know what the hell the leftover... Uh, detritus is going to be with the Clippers from what happened last year. Sometimes that stuff just breaks you. Sometimes you can't recover from it. You talk a good game, you have a nice regular season. When the chips are down, you can't recover from that. I don't know. Maybe the Clippers will. To me, the Lakers are in a tier of their own. And this is, I mean, what else can you say? Like, yeah, could they, are, is it going to be hard for them to get a third max player? Yeah, they'll have to clear the decks. Bobby Mark says they could do it in the summer of 2023 if they clear the decks, whatever. They'll re sign all their people. They can make sign and trades. Like, it's a home run for them. You have these guys under contract. It's amazing. Uh, it, it, the Lakers are just like doing victory laps now. 
<laughs> and just like sticking their tongue out at the rest of the league. Um, it, it's ab- absolutely on every count, a phenomenal off season. And it's very rare in today's NBA, Zach. And I, I, again, with the exception of the Warriors, um, being able to sign Durant with this historic, bizarre cap spike in 2016 for a team, either coming off a championship or championship caliber, the Warriors obviously didn't win that year, but to have to be able to, to take a championship caliber team and improve it is really hard now because of the cap, because you draft low, because you're usually uh, out picks and out other stuff to have created your 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 team in the first. Like it's hard to win a championship and then improve. And these aren't like dramatic improvements, like they added a third all-star or anything like that, but these were significant, substantial improvements to the roster. Um they had to they uh, they got the one and two finishers and six man of the year. Yeah. Um, this just does not happen. It's it's really really hard to do. So uh, kudos to Rob Polink and his staff and 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 Jeannie Bus Lake organization. They have just cleaned up, um, and getting the commitments from LeBron and, and AD all, all the more. And you're right. You know, if if a year ago it felt for a lot of us like a coin flip between the two LA teams, um, I leaned Clippers at the time because of their I, depth. No, I let, like full disclosure. I picked the Clippers to win the title, start to finish, and I was I did. dead wrong. I, I did as well, but it wasn't by leaps and bounds. It was it was no. a bit of a coin flip, and it was based on their three through nine, right? Well, they don't have the advantage of the three through nine now, um, and they they clearly never had the advantage with the the one and two players. So the gap has has increased. Could the Clippers still become a better version of themselves? Could the chemistry get better? Could they figure out? Uh, you know, is, is Serge Ibaka an upgrade for Montrez Harrell? Yes, but it should be should be. Um, and then you don't know, like. Is, is Denver ready to make a big leap? Uh, we all love what Portland did in the off season, uh, but is is that enough? Like I, you're right. Like it, the, I don't know. The Lakers are a lock the way that the Warriors with Durant were a no, lock. Nobody, where we felt like it was a over. Lock. Nobody's a right. lock. But I'm saying but when, I, when I tier clear, the contenders, clear favorites. Yeah, yes. when I tier the contenders, yes. I just don't see anybody in the Lakers tier. And no. given what happened to Milwaukee in the postseason again. I think the Clippers are really the only candidate to be in that tier, and I can't put them there. I can't put them yeah. there. And and let's just end with this. Let's let's go way far ahead. Let's go way far ahead. So I wrote the obligatory MJ LeBron piece after they won the title, and that was four yes. rings for LeBron. And my general conclusion was, you know, the statistical case is not going to be close. Like it's it, LeBron's going to be the all time leading scorer. He's going to lap MJ in every statistical case, and that's part of that is longevity. Part of that is baseball. But whatever, whatever you want to ascribe it to, it's going to come down to right now. It comes down to what I wrote was it comes down to like how much you value six and zero oh versus yeah. four and six, and the the Dallas meltdown that happened to them. I don't think any of their other finals losses. They weren't favorites in any of them. Whatever LeBron's finals losses. What I wrote was he gets one more and it's five to six. Even if your record's five to six in the finals, he gets one more. I really think, and this is how I ended the story. I really think when people take a clear eyed look at it and the stats, and if it's five rings, let's say it stops at five. I, I just think it's going to be not overwhelming, but I think there it's just when people are able to take off the MJ glasses and we all grew up with MJ, I just think it's the, the grounds the grounds by which you can argue Michael will be the greatest ever will be will be narrower and narrower and narrower. But that's a big if, obviously. But they do walk into next season as the big favorites, I think. They walk in as the big favorites. And unless something goes horribly awry, injuries or otherwise, or some other team just just everything clicks perfectly, there's a very good chance that, that LeBron gets ring number five. And we're having this discussion in a in a in a, in a very vivid way. Um the Jordan uh, crowd will always point to six and zero, oh, and it will be the ultimate answer to every other other point that can be made in LeBron's favor. It will always come back six and zero, oh, six and zero, oh, six and zero. Oh. And the answer back from the LeBron uh, camp would simply be okay. But look at how many finals he made. Um, nobody like that. That is a is a sign of dominance in and of itself. And so we'll go round and round and round. But to your point, Zach, I think. It, it's more like the long view of history. It's it's kind of more, I feel like, what people will decide, not next summer or on the day that LeBron retires. It's going to be more about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years from now, because when we talk about Bill Russell or Kareem um, or anybody from the, the distant past, we're viewing it with the with the totality of everybody's careers having been been done for years. It's fixed. We have all the data in front of us, all the all the anecdotes, all the narratives, all the stats. And we and we and we do a, a kind of a cool calculation where, 
you know, we weren't there to watch Bill Russell dominate. So we, we just, we know how to assess it based on secondhand information and, and the history books and some grainy film and whatever. At some point down the road, 10, 15, 20 years, I think there will be pre- basketball fans and pundits of that era who will be saying, wait a minute, how is this even close? <laughs> LeBron has beaten him by 8,000 points and and 15,000 assists. And ah, he's one ring short, but he went to twice as many finals. Um, There may become a day down the road when people are less beholden to the eras that they grew up in or the player that they watched most or loved the, the, the game of the most. It may just come down to the fact that when people can just see the cold hard facts in front of them 20 years from now, 50 years from now, whatever it is, they're going to say, how how is LeBron not considered leaps and bounds? Well, we we better? we every, everyone gets more clear eyed about everything with time, right? Like in in the moment, there were all these, and it's not just the, the top top guys. There were all these debates about, well, Charles is never going to win a title. Stockton Malone never won a title, and, and Ewing never won a title, and all the guys who never won a title. And boy, their legacy is going to be tarnished if they don't win a title. And then you like time goes by, and you reflect on it. It's like, man, those guys were just great. They were great. The fact that they didn't win a title wasn't really about them. Yeah, Carl had some bad moment finals, some bad missed free throws. The mailman doesn't deliver on Sundays, all that. But like, you start to be like, well, why didn't they win? And and you know, what does it really say something about their legacy and their career? And the answer is no. You just appreciate their greatness. So it happens for everybody. All right, Mister Beck, yeah. um, thank you for coming on. I missed you, and uh, we'll do it again soon. Stay safe out there in New York. And uh, I don't know, any parting thoughts? Um, no parting thoughts in particular. Thank you for this. Appreciate it. Um, always good to catch up with you. Always good to uh, to, to talk NBA with you. Um, and uh, I know I've been uh, quiet for the masses out there who uh, I've promised some, some news sometime soon. I will have news very, very soon on um, uh, what's next for me, um, including a podcast. Uh, including writing, including all that stuff. So um, thank you for letting me uh, tease everybody just for the moment. It's coming soon, I swear. All right, Howard Beck, thank you for your time, my friend. I'll see you soon. I look forward to that news. Thanks again. Thank you, Zach. All right, it's kind of been Atlanta Hawks week here on the Low Post Podcast, so why not bring in, I don't know, the head coach of the Atlanta Hawks, Lloyd Pierce. How are you, sir? Good. How are you doing? I'm hanging in. I'm hanging in. Have you forgotten at any point in the last nine months that you are indeed a basketball coach and not a voting rights expert, <laughs> registration <laughs> advocate, um, election statistics expert? Have you forgotten that you are also the coach of the Hawks at some point? No, no. That, um, you know, you just you, you wear many hats, as they say. Uh, first and foremost, I'm a husband and a father, so that one hasn't changed. Uh, everything else kind of shifts from week to week or day to day. So I get reminded uh, from time to time that I still get to coach, and I'm definitely reminded now as we're about to start up. If you ever win Coach of the Year, you just gave me great confidence in your award speech that you're not going to forget to thank your wife and family. <laughs> you, you just like slid it in there right off the bat. Um so very it's just let's start with the stuff that actually matters um you your state your current state georgia has been really the center of the political universe you can go back to the 2018 gubernatorial election but certainly the general election um where it flipped to democrat and now these two runoffs happening at the same time with like control of the senate um at stake the hawks have done incredible work uh both um helping voters register and opening their arena. I think you had like 40,000 people vote at the arena or something in the presidential election. Um, Just obviously you don't take a job like this expecting politics to be such a big part of your life. What are some of the the memories and and the stories that you will take with you, particularly from the, the presidential election night, weekend, week, like whatever it turned into? What are your memories from that? Well, I think you, you do have to go back to the 2018 uh, gubernatorial race. Um, it was my introduction into the South and into the into politics in the South. When you see Stacey Abrams uh, and Brian Kemp in that race and the fallout as, as a result. And, you know, in a lot of ways, it was one of the silver linings 
Stacey Abrams creates Fair Fight, and she creates the many organizations, including the New Georgia Project. Um, she's very instrumental in educating uh, citizens on their right to vote, but educating them in a way that um, can assist them and encourage them to register to vote, which is really where, where I think a lot of people fall behind. And I think because of that, you see not only us as an organization, but the entire NBA, the entire country really get behind how do we increase voter participation because it is our right. And all of the different organizations, when we all vote more than a vote, I am a voter, all of those different organizations were created with the very um, same foundation that Fair Fight was created. I don't know who was first, but I know that the active uh, participation to encourage, to market, to really re recruit people, the understanding of what it takes to change, flip uh, an election like we saw this year. And, you know, 2020 was a hell of a year and this election was a hell of an election. Um, but I think that was kind of my introduction. And that was the silver lining of her not winning the governor's seat here in 2018. But I, I was really proud of our organization, our ownership, uh, for opening up State Farm Arena, for one, um, I was proud of our league and everyone else for for following suit, and I'm I'm doubly impressed with the fact that we're able to open it up again, uh, starting I think next week or two weeks on the 14th. We'll have it at State Farm for a week, and then it'll transfer over to an even bigger uh, place with Mercedes Benz for the following two weeks. So we'll occupy the early voting. It is the center of the universe right now. The attention, the amount of attention. I've been on Zoom calls with celebrities and, and um, so many influencers. Uh, it's mind blowing. It really is. It's mind blowing the amount of people. I've been on Zoom calls with Kerry Washington and Amy Schumer and Mark Ruffalo and all of these different people that are passionate about um, getting people registered to vote and educating um, as many people as they can with their influence. And, you know, I'm just trying to do my part. And so just really proud to be in this city and really proud to be a part of this organization. How much of um, the history of Georgia voter suppression did you know before 2018? And like, I didn't know much about it. I started reading about purging rolls when people didn't vote regularly, the signature matching rule. And as someone whose wife uh, has a hyphenated last name, I know how screwy that can get because I've seen her live through everything getting screwed up. Like, how much of that did you know? And, 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 and sort of have you seen people dealing with that up close, voters dealing with that up close? And by the way, voters of all of all stripes, like whatever your political stance is, everyone should register to vote. Like it doesn't like that's the let's let's just get that out there. I mean, I think I know where you lie. You probably know where I lie. But like voting is the most fundamental thing you can do, no matter what your political stripes are. Yeah. Yeah. Um... You know, I think I think there's a lot of ways of, of really understanding voter suppression and understanding equally understanding the importance of, of being able to vote. Uh, the Civil Rights Act, uh, the civil rights movement, I should say, was centered around um, the ability to vote for people of color. And that's why the, the Voting Rights Act was passed in 1965. But then you go back to 1920 and you think of women being able to vote for the first time. Uh, and so you, you do have to really recognize and appreciate the fact that all we're trying to do and all most people are trying to do is, is give the opportunity for those that have the opportunity to vote. And when you understand voter suppression, as we all are understanding it more and more, because for some of us who grew up in California, suppression was not the issue that you had to deal with and you knew california was going to be blue and there weren't a whole lot of fight to keep people from voting when you come down south like i did in 2018 and you say whoa why is it such an issue to keep people from voting to keep fulton county from voting to keep clayton county from voting well because of uh, the 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 not wanting the state to turn blue or to not having certain people to be able to vote and exercise that right. But what I've also learned in addition to suppression is the importance of a census and the importance of being counted and being counted for and the, 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 the finances being able to go to those communities as well. And so there's a greater picture even beyond these elections of 
really giving people who need more opportunities to understand how to get those opportunities through the census, through voting, through electing their officials. Uh, this is how we create change is we have to educate, we have to be educated on what we're missing out on and how we can attain those things. And that's just one phase. How do we get more healthcare? How do we get more people understanding, um, you know, the fact that there are certain communities that are restricted from voting, from restricted from the same educational rights, healthcare rights, and things of that nature that are dealing with law enforcement issues. And we have to address it and we do it first and foremost by voting the right leaders and officials in our cities, in our states, um, to help be a part of that change. But I grew up in California, simple answer. <laughs> and yeah. you, you just you just didn't see this with regards to voting as much as you're seeing it here. And you have that that nasty 76ers hat on right now. I just, uh, it's just a hat. I just have it. I just say <laughs> it's just a hat that was next to me. I'm sorry, coach. You, you were no, there for I, a long time. You probably have it, some fond memories, it, I would think. It's all right. What, what I'm saying is, uh, you know, before I was in Georgia, I was in PA. Before I was in PA, I was in Ohio. And, you know, when you think of the three states and the, the importance of those three states when it comes to elections, um, I've gotten a sense of all of it from all three of those states that I've lived in. Yeah, I vote. I live in Connecticut now and I voted when I voted. I, I was on the phone. I, I was just making a call and I walk home with a high level African-American person in the NBA. I won't say what his job yep. title is or anything like that. And he was like, man, you live in Connecticut. You're white. Would it take you six minutes? Six minutes, seven minutes, you just walked right in and voted. I was like, just about, <laughs> just yeah. about. And it's very different when you re I mean, like, I've learned so much about that topic over the last few and, years. And and I won't, I, I mean, I live in um, DeKalb County. And in DeKalb County, it took me 15 minutes or less every single time that I voted. And then you come out and I'm trying to post my picture with my wife and our, our Georgia peach stickers on our saying we voted. And then all of a sudden you're saying on on the internet, how Fulton County, there are lines for three hours. And so it, it, you don't have to be in Connecticut or white. It's, it's right where I am. Um, you know, right in this area, if I were two blocks over or whatever it may be, and I'm in a different County, I would be going through the same issues. So Georgia flips in the presidential election. What's your what's your flashbulb memory from either that day helping people vote or I don't know if it's where you were when the you know, we were all no matter what your political stripes are. I'm sure people were checking those statistics on the Times website like every five minutes. Refresh, refresh, refresh when it hit or, you know, it was clear what the math was before. But I don't know if you have a memory of when it flipped or just just someone that you talked to on election. That, like, what's a story that's going to stick with you? Or well, has it flipped yet? <laughs> I feel like we're still dealing with the results and the runoffs and the counts. And um, yeah, you know, I've, ch I've checked. I've checked out of that one, Coach. I gotta, <laughs> I've got to admit, I, I made a. I made an intellectual decision. I said, I'm right. just. I'm just checking out. I'm going to assume that it's done, and I'm going to move on. Right. No, I, I, I was in California the week of the elections. Uh, oh, you did yeah. the early. You did only the early stuff. I, yeah, I, I, I did. I did. A, well, well, at State Farm, we were only open for early voting. That's right. And we weren't open for the day of, and and so I was out, uh, out of state the week of the election. And you're like everyone. I mean, there was probably I was on a time adjustment in California. I just couldn't sleep. And you also can't sleep because you're you turn on MSNBC or CNN or whatever you watch and you're just watching it for three straight hours. And you think like something's going to happen in those three straight hours because you're seeing numbers change every hour. But, you know, it's still three to four days before you're really going to get a definitive answer at the very earliest um, but no, I, I was, uh, I was really encouraged by more so that the amount of people that were voting and seeing the record numbers come in and understanding how everyone's effort to increase voter registration really took, took part in this, uh, not just ours, but just across the world, all the people that had been sending emails, those, those, those phone calls, um, the social media, all the different organizations that were trying to get people registered to vote. And then you're seeing it in the state of Texas. You're seeing it in the state of Georgia. You're seeing it everywhere. There were just more people exercising their right to vote. And this is why we have change. And now, um, flash forward, not even a month, uh, you have two close Senate runoffs um, 
in your in your state, one of which involves an owner of a WNBA team. So the basketball world has been uh, incredibly closely involved in that election for months now. Um, that's obviously Kelly Loeffler, who's running against Reverend Warnock. Um, you have, I believe, have one last big voter registration event this week in, in Atlanta. I think registration ends on the 7th of December. Today we're recording this on the 3rd. What, what can you tell us about that? Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that, that I've been educated on, and I think a lot of people have, is the decrease in participation from a presidential election to any type of Senate runoff. Um, and particularly for Democrats, um, for the Democratic Party, particularly for uh, people that vote by mail. Um, and so I think it's really understanding how important this Senate race is um, in terms of creating change, being able to uh, have things come to legislation um, and to be voted on and be represented in its full capacity. This this Senate race really, um, really occupies that and understanding how important that is moving forward. We, yeah, we voted, there's, there's a new president that's coming, a new vice president that's coming, a new party will be in, in the White House. In order for them to enact change, they're gonna need to run things a lot through the Senate. And that's why this race is extremely important but also understanding that there's a usual drop off in, in Senate runoffs. And so, you know, understanding December 7th is the last day to register to vote. I know a lot of people have been charged up and there's a lot of events to get people registered to vote. I've been working with the New Georgia Project as an event on Saturday, December 5th um, at the Gateway Center where our G League team plays, the, the parking lot of where our G League team plays. and. Uh, there'll be folks out there that are able to register you to vote if you need to. Uh, but we're, what we're really doing is we're providing a food drive uh, to deal with the food insecurity that's been going on in our country. And uh, myself and a lot of the players on our team and, and Jalen Brown, who was an Atlanta native, um, they've all um, sponsored the event. Uh, we've all sponsored the event and try to do a little bit to just provide meals uh, for as many families as we can from nine to 12 on Saturday morning at the, uh, and that's, and that represents one of those counties that represents, uh, I think it's a little bit of Fulton, maybe Clayton County. It's kind of the border, uh, South Atlanta area, uh, where there are a lot of food insecurity issues. Well, what the Hawks have done has been remarkable. You guys have really taken the lead among NBA teams and maybe pro sports teams, um, in the U S to make voting. A priority and it's something that everyone should applaud and I applaud you for it and we'll see what happens in in what's January something I don't know what the date is we'll see what happens in on that January will you indulge me a few Hawks questions you're the team of the offseason coach it's like there's Hawks mania yeah. now it's like you spending all this money left and right showering free agents with money you ready to go yeah you know it's um as you know, with that 76ers hat, um, everything happens through some sort of process. And um, I think as you navigate through the NBA and you navigate through any sport, um, you know, every team's on a different timeline. And uh, some teams are ready now. Some teams are, are, are soon to be ready and some teams are trying to get ready. And, you know, we've positioned ourselves. Travis has done a tremendous job of positioning our, our organization. Um, to be able to not only draft extremely well as we've done in the past and, and give ourselves an opportunity to grow and develop those guys. But now we're in a position and we've obviously done so uh, to go out and, and use the cap space that we've had to attract the best free agents we think we can get. And I think we've done that uh, to add a Rajon Rondo, to add a Danilo Gallinari and Bogdan Bogdanovich, to bring on Tony Snell and Solomon Hill um, to, to, to bring in Chris Dunn, um, you know, what a, what a combination of players, there's versatility, there's some depth, there's some experience, there's some leadership and there's some production. Uh, so I look forward to our group, but I think it was, it was one of those things that that's definitely just part of our plan. It's where we positioned ourselves. We took full advantage of this, this free agency to, to really be in a position to get the guys we wanted. And I think we've done Travis and his, his staff has done a tremendous job of doing so. All right. So let's, let me ask the dumb fundamental <coughs> questions, the basics. 
Uh, based on Gallo's comments on media, media week, media day one of five, I don't know what the hell we're calling this now. Um, I'm assuming he's coming off the bench. I think that was discussed upon his signing. You guys all have talked about that. So I'm assuming four starters are set in stone. Trey, Bogdanovich. You'll find Colin. out December 23rd. I think oh, come on. Right. Indulge me, coach. Collins, Capella. Okay, that leaves the three in the starting five. So, okay, so you're not going to tell me if four starters are set in stone. Fine, be that way. Um, let me ask you this then. Let me ask you it this way. I'm guessing- I, mean, I mean, think about it. Think about it. And you got to put yourself in my shoe. What advantage do I have going into training camp telling my guys they need to compete and then me coming on here telling you I got the starters already figured out? Touche. Touche. Well, I don't – Fine, <laughs> fine. Throw the logic at me. Okay, so so uh, let let me ask it this way. I'm guessing. Okay, my educated guess would be at least one young guy, one of your young wings of the Hunter Herder Reddish trio, who started a lot last year, is going to have to come off the bench, if not two. Are those conversations going to be tough? Are they? Do you just sit them down and tell them what the deal is, or are you just confident? Like I said earlier this week, I actually think the Hawks can pretty much like it. Just because you come off the bench doesn't mean your development is suddenly stalled. Like you can still get 20, 25 minutes a game. Like I think you can thread the needle of winning now and still developing those young guys. But people care about starting in the NBA. It's a funny thing. People really do care about. It. Some people do. Is that are those conversations going to be tough? Or are they already primed for it? People care about their money. People care about winning. People care about being in the NBA and people care about starting. And I, I almost think it's kind of that order. Um, you know, we'd all love to say we want to win and winning's first. I, <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> I get it. I, I completely get it. And I think the biggest thing that I can do is, is be myself. I think you've kind of gotten to know that about me is just be myself. I'm always, uh, I tell you what I feel and what I think. And, you know, I, I'm the same guy all the time. So when I communicate with our players, I tell them exactly what the deal is. Uh, I don't know. And so I am preaching competition and that is coach talk, but it, it's the reality. I don't know. We'll figure it out uh, come December 23rd or whatever, we, whatever day we start. Uh, but they all know. There's a chance that you may start. There's a chance that you may not. You figure it out. You let me know. Uh, well, I already on, made my I already made my started. prediction, and you shot I me know. down. I know, but you also don't have to run uh, suicides or do the defensive drill and make make shots in practice. Those guys do, and I think they understand that they look forward to the challenge, and they'll know. These guys will know. They'll know if somebody's a little bit better than them right now. I'll tell you, uh, Coach, if you bring me down there, I will run hard <laughs> into suicides. Okay, I'll run you hard. Know, I'll get into defensive stance. I'll slide. But I don't think you. I don't think you want to be a part of this first practice that we got coming up. <laughs> I make so shots. If, if you want to, if you want to pull a vet move, you you miss out on the first day because the first day won't be a lot of fun. Have you internalized like that the play in is a thing? Like I, I I find myself having to constantly think and remind myself. Oh yeah, if you're tenth. You're gonna have a shot to make the playoffs this year. It's like cognitively, I'm not quite there yet. Yeah, you know, I thought the playoff playing uh, brought some excitement to the to the bubble, and obviously, when they bring extra teams uh, to compete for that last spot, it, it, it's going to make it competitive. And it did. The Memphis Portland series was extremely competitive uh, leading into it forget the games between those two, just leading up to getting to that game. It, it made it intriguing. Um, but I'm obviously, I'm not sitting here trying to get to the 10th spot. And, um, you know, now that there's a play in, you, you're trying to figure out how to avoid the play in, you know, I, the race for six, the race for six is going to be a really right, interesting thing. Right. You know, and I, and, and in the last go round, it was really the importance of, of, of seating. How do you, how do you compete for seating? So you have home court advantage. And, you know, I think at some point this is different than the bubble home court advantage is going to be uh, important again. The teams will be fighting for that. You know, hopefully there's more fans towards the end of the year and home court advantage does become truly think about that. If fans are starting to pour into the arenas late in the year, which would be great, who knows? But if that is the case, that is definitely going to be home court advantage. And so 
you know, we're not sitting here saying, how do we get to the tenth of the playing game? We, we, we have to figure out what do we do to maximize every day? What do we do to maximize every game so we can control what we, we think is going to be our destiny as a team? But we don't we haven't we haven't practiced. I got a lot of good players. They got a lot of depth. We have a long way to go. Uh, and I look forward to it. I think our guys are great. I think they're high character guys. Um, our young guys are tremendous and they've been with me for two years. I've been with them for two years. So I'm excited about this group. Uh, two more quick ones. Um, Danilo Gallinari plays a lot of four. Um, Hunter, DeAndre Hunter played a decent chunk of four last year. John Collins has been your starting four apparently the whole starting lineup like Trey Young might come I'm assuming I'm going to just say Trey Young might come off the bench based on your earlier comments who knows the whole thing's in flux um I'm just kidding coach um and you, you have a you have a history you have a you 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 have a future in coaching you're learning <laughs> uh and and Clint Capella is obviously a center John has played some center all of this is to say there's a lot of tea leaf reading about whoa what is John Collins future on this team he's up for an extension I said on my podcast on Monday I think we need to hit the brakes on that a little bit because, A, I'm, I'm actually pretty optimistic you guys can get a deal done with John. B, if Gallo's coming off the bench, I think it's not that hard to start John at the four. Again, you're not going to commit to anything, but just like bring Gallo in for John, then bring John in as a backup five. Like it's not that hard to find a pathway to John Collins playing 35 minutes or 30 minutes basically as he normally does, right? It really isn't. Um, what do they call Golden State's the, the death lineup? Is that what it was? Who was the five? Draymond. Really isn't that hard, <laughs> you know. It, and you know, I, I, I look at our, our Eastern Conference and I say, well, you know, who's going to be tough for us? Boston. Who's there for? Jalen Brown. That's tough for John. He's got to learn how to defend and chase him, but it's tough. And so there's where DeAndre gets to play some four, and then you go to Brooklyn. Man, KD might be at the four. It's tough for anybody. KD Forget might that. KD might be at the five. Right, and and so and then you go you go out west and you, you're playing the Lakers and you say, well, AD's the four. We kind of need John and Gallo to get down there a little bit, and and maybe Clint has to take that matchup and put John and Gallo on the five man because they got Gasol now, and the, every game's going di- to give us a different opportunity to be different, and 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 then you flip it over. Wow, John's our five. Gallo's our five. Who's chasing? They're bringing their five men to guard Gallo on the perimeter. All right. I like like that. That's spicy. Uh, um, You know, have fun with that. You know, Gallo, I'm looking at film on his Italian national team. He's guarding Jokic, but Jokic has to guard him when they're playing Serbia. So um, as a coach, this is fun. This is exciting. I'm excited to say, all right, Gallo, you're the five. All right. You know, D Hunt, you're the five. We're going to go real small. We got Chris Dunn and Cam Reddish and, and DeAndre Hunter and Rajon Rondo. And look at our defensive switch lineup. And we're going to compete our ass off because we can do some of that. And we'll do the same thing on the other end offensively. But I'd rather have that and try and figure it out than to not have it and not be able to figure it out. If you're watching Gallo Italian national team games, the offseason has been too long. You got enough Gallo NBA film that well, you. you you have to remember, I was with um, with Team USA. And, I know. Uh, I, what I was really watching was Serbia because they were one of my scouts, and we were hoping to play them, and we did play them, but not in not in the game we wanted to play them in. No, that uh, didn't that didn't work out. Serbia's coach talked a lot of trash too leading up yeah, to, leading up to that tournament. It didn't it didn't work out. Last one. Uh, one of the reasons I loved the Bogdanovich signing for you, and I wrote this last week, is it another ball handler that accomplished, that crafty, that smart. I think you'll be able to tap in if if Trey is willing to do it. The sort of Trey off ball Steph Curry impression that everyone's waiting for Trey to kind of add to his game. And it's easy to say, "Hey, do what Steph does: set screens, run around." You got to have another ball handler who can really run an offense to do that, right? Is that something we're going to see? You're already shaking your head no at me. No, because it's it's not it's not as simple as just run around. Um, Steph is a run around player. That that's that I would say he's more of that than he is a pick and roll player. Trey is a pick and roll player that is, you know, also a guy that can play off the ball. And you, you don't just tell a guy to run around. Uh, I think I think when you look at the game and you look at, well, how do you use Trey when he's off the basketball? Well, you know, Trey gets a lot of attention 
And so if they're going to give them a lot of attention and they're going to box in one or they're going to hug up on them, then we, we have guys that are rolling to the rim and no one's helping on that. We got to put Trey in that position. Trey should be the best screener in the NBA like Kyle Lowry is because they don't want to leave Trey's body. And so now we're his screens are getting people open. You, you have to you have to use Trey in a way that benefits Trey, not trying to create him to be something he's not or, you know, it's not natural for him. And I think that's really the best way to maximize your players is to use them in a way that they can be successful, not trying to figure out, well, only if you watch him and you should study his movement and just do everything he does. Because uh, we're not going to change our offense to be like that either. Well, you've dashed my dreams of being a coach because I can't announce my starting lineup before camp and I can't just tell Trey Young, hey, just run around. Like that that, that was going to be my strategy. So I'm done. I'm done. My ambitions are my ambitions have been quashed. Coach, you got a team meeting to go to. Thank you for making time and thank you for the work you have been doing um, in Georgia. Keep it up and uh, in, enjoy being a basketball coach again full time. And please, we didn't we didn't get into it because it, it's too it's the elephant in the room. And sometimes I don't want to talk about the elephant because uh, it sucks and i hate the elephant but uh please stay safe keep your players safe keep your family safe as the season comes and the travel comes and all that but thank you very much for your time you got it take care guys